Hey guys. All right. So we've now got to the point where we can actually talk about some applications to these fields, right? We've talked about the electric field and the magnetic field. So now we can actually see what we can do with charges. So um, just a quick recap here, looking at what we did. Uh, we have electric fields that behave in a way that accelerates charges. They speed up charges because the force and electric field are always collinear. Whereas with the magnetic field, it's always at right angles. So if we stick together these two forces, um, we can actually come up with what we call the Lorentz force. So this is a um, an expression for the force from any electric or magnetic field. And we'll talk about the connection between electric and magnetic fields in the next lesson. But here, now we have a, a way that we can manipulate charges. We can speed them up and we can change their direction. Or we can also slow them down too, right? So we have this thing, this Lorentz force, that, that allows us to, if we're using electric fields, change the speed of part of charged particles, or with a magnetic field, change which way they're they're going. We can always change that we also change the direction of the, the force, sorry, of the charge with an electric field by having an electric field at right angles to its velocity. But here we go. We have some ways of, of, of changing the dynamics of, a, of, of charges. And so what we can do with that is we can come up with some engineering to take charges and get them going very, very fast and then point them at each other. So we get some, some either you know small things like electrons or larger things like protons or even atoms themselves smashing them into each other. What happens there is a large amount of kinetic energy has to be released in some way. And this is how we um, dive into the atomic structure and subatomic structure of reality. And we're able to, to see how, how particles, when they hit each other and, and go into these incredibly high energies, energies that, you know, rival the you know the big bang itself uh, we get to see uh, all kinds of new particles being formed and behaving in very strange ways this is how we developed the standard model they started doing this they started smashing particles into each other and they ended up creating basically a subatomic particle zoo they called it there were just too many particles being created all the time this was in about the 60s and the way they did this is with something called a cyclotron. This is the first uh, type of apparatus that they used to smash uh, charged ions at each other. So the way it works, basically, is we have uh, a source of something, of some, um, some ions. It could be even something as simple as uh, a hot piece of metal. You know, a piece of metal that has uh, a large amount of current through it to the point where uh, the electrons are being ejected from there, okay? So, so we make those things, and we're able to, using a magnetic field, sorry, I need my pen here, uh, we're able to, using a magnetic field, uh, change the direction, they go backwards. So since we have this magnetic field, uh, this is a cross-sectional view on the side here, we have our magnetic field going from, uh, in this case, they're showing it north to south, um, we are able to, using the right-hand rule, create this small radius, okay? And then once it, once it leaves, it goes in this, in this gap here between these two magnets. They call these magnets, or this, uh, it's called Ds. They call them D-shaped electrodes. And they're hollow inside. So the electrons or the whatever particle are able to, to travel inside these. Then there's magnets slapped on top of it. So when it, a jacks come, comes out of here, let's say, let's say follow this path here, it gets to here, and now since they, we lose an, um, let's use an electron, it's negative. So we'll make this D positive, and this one negative. So it'll be attracted towards the positive side. The, basically inside here we end up with a uh, uniform electric field, right? Because of, this ends up being like a, uh, the, the plates, right? The same idea. So it's accelerated, so it's sped up just a little bit. But since it's sped up, now that it's entered that same magnetic field, its radius increases. Remember, as it goes faster, then the radius would have to increase. It has more energy, and that magnetic field can't make it rotate. It changes directions fast enough, 
and it has a larger radius than it previously did. Now it exits again, but now if we kept this plus and minus, it would be repelled away from it, but that's not, that's not gonna help us, that's not gonna speed things up. So we have a, a, a generator here that will change the polarity. It'll swap the polarity in there. So it now is a positive, so it's gonna be accelerated again. And now it's accelerated again, it's even larger radius than the, the second time it went through. And the second time it went through, and it will have even a larger radius. And then we do flip it again, we flip the signs again. We have a square wave generator, basically just a sine wave that positive, negative, and then we just flip back and forth. And each time it, it switches through here, it accelerates a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And then by the time it exits, it's going very, very fast. Right, so there's a mag magnets making it go around in circles, and a switching polarity in these electrodes. So we have an electric field inside and a magnetic field going at. So we could show here if we wanted to show our magnetic field. There's a magnetic field going in. Okay, at right angles to that, keeping everything. So we'd have a, a centripetal force all the time, spinning everything around, okay? So these were the first particle accelerators that were developed in the 60s, in the early 50s and the 60s. And we end up with these high velocity, like quite high velocity uh, electrons or protons or whatever they wanted. They could even they, you know, put a polonium source inside. So we have um, uh, helium nuclei, alpha particles buzzing around inside here. And you, you take two of these and you stick them together, put a bunch of detectors around it and find out what mess you've created. Because these particles are going to smash into each other at incredibly high speeds, at incredibly high energies, and all kinds of new particles are formed. And that's where we come up with our standard model. But prior to the standard model, there was hundreds of these new subatomic particles and we slowly figured out how to classify them. Okay. Now, there are some problems here. The main problem with the cyclotron is it's limited to its speed. And that's because the mass changes as you get faster. This is a very strange idea. This is, this is Einstein's relativity here. As mass, as velocity increases, you get heavier. The faster you're traveling, the heavier you are. And it's related by this formula here. We're going to do this in the, the our fifth unit, our, our modern physics unit. Hopefully we'll get to it. Uh, and it this expression here will derive it, actually. Uh, this is the velocity that's traveling. It's the speed squared divided by the speed of light squared, so the ratio of the squares. One minus that, square root, one over that. Now, what does that actually mean? So let's say I'm traveling 1,000 kilometers an hour. Okay, like I'm, I'm sorry, 1,000 meters a second. So three times the speed of sound. Yeah, I'm traveling one kilometer every second. Okay, so at that rate, my mass only changes in the, I think, 12th decimal. So with uh, my ma a mass of an electron will not change except for way back in like the 12th decimal. So it really has no effect on what we call classical mechanics, anything that happens at normal speeds that we typically talk about, this effect is, is doesn't even show up compared to typical other errors. Uh, let's say I'm now traveling a million meters a second. I'm traveling 1,000 kilometers a second. Okay, I, In half a second, I'm in Toronto. Okay, In two seconds, I'm in Nova Scotia. At that speed, I'm now in the, what is that, the sixth decimal? I, I'm, I have a, a correction factor here at the sixth decimal, so really barely anything, even at a million meters a second. At a hundred million meters a second, I'm starting to see some, some effects. They have a 6% change in mass. I'm 6% heavier if I'm traveling a hundred million meters a second. It starts to become quite evident, though, once we get closer and closer to the speed of light. Once we're now at like 90% of the speed of, of light, I'm going to be twice as heavy. Okay, And as we get closer and closer, you know, 95% of the speed of light, three times as heavy. 99% of the speed of light, I get seven times as heavy. And this is an asymptotic relationship with respect to 
uh, velocity as it cl gets closer and closer to c, right? As we, as we take this expression, as we take v approaches c, that expression we call it gamma approaches infinity. So your mass actually approaches infinity once you get closer and closer. And this is this causes problems in terms of the the synchro synchronization of a, of a cyclotron. Right, for our cyclotron, uh, let's go back here. We, we we need to use this square wave generator to to synchronize our our switching at very very high rates to get the electrodes at the right polarity so that we have a, um, a, a we are accelerating at the right time. We're giving it the kick at the right time. We're not slowing it down. Once the mass starts changing, things get weird. And it's difficult. We have to. They, there are some ways that you can do it, but because the the radius is going to change with respect to m, as my radius, my as my mass increases, my radius is going to increase. So I have to start changing my my synchronization. I lose synchronization, and I'm not giving it the right kick. Uh, now engineers were able to. to you know, play with the uh, oscillation frequencies to get this to work, but work somewhat. But the main problem also was the the magnets to get to make get magnets that big, especially in the '60s when we didn't have all these fancy neodymium new magnets. Um, it, cyclotrons had a a limit to the amount of energy that they could generate. So the next step was what we called a linear accelerator. This is much simpler. This is just basically hollow electrodes, hollow tubes that charged particles can travel in. Okay? Once we once we get to these higher energies, this is actually a much more straightforward much more straightforward approach. Uh, each of the 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 pieces are uh, sorry the electrodes are at a certain length that allows them to accelerate it just a little bit. And then the polarity again between them all is going to switch. So let's say here, I, I take my particle, it's now going to be accelerated towards the negative electrode here. And once it gets in between them, they, we're going to switch the polarity. So now it's going to be accelerated again in each, each step. And notice as we get faster and faster, the electrodes have to get longer. But this is much easier to do. So we just have to change the length of our electrodes as we go along. Okay. So once we start dealing with... Um, relativistic effects where the mass is increasing all we have to do to correct that is change our length of our electrode the frequency in which this changes doesn't have to change it's only the length of the pieces that have to change so it becomes much simpler the problem is these things become incredibly long and have to be incredibly straight which is why the Stanford linear accelerator which is the most famous of these uh, ended up actually being one of the longest buildings in the world for quite some time. It's a three kilometer long straight laser, basically. And this is a picture of it inside. You can't even see the end. It's, it's a three kilometer long linear accelerator. And it was able to achieve beam strengths of six, uh, sorry, 50 giga electron volts. We'll talk about what that means later when we in our uh, our fifth unit, our modern physics unit. But that's a very large amount of energy. Uh, lots and lots of, of of huge research was done into the 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 fabric of of baryons, of quarks, of what 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 our universe is made up of. Or the the standard model was basically uh, developed here. A lot of the um, the quantum chromodynamics, it's called, of how do, how do uh, quarks behave was figured out here at the Stanford Linear Accelerator. Uh, currently, the lo another longer building is the uh, the LIGO Observatory, the Gravitational Wave Observatory. It's four kilometers long. It's the, uh, it's, well, it's four kilometers both ways. It's a laser. Uh, it's four kilometers on both sides. And then they look at how they interfere inside here. But we'll talk about that in, actually in our fourth unit, in our next unit after this, optics. Okay? So, now... What's next? Okay, now the the latest uh, technology for particle accelerators are called synchrotrons, which is basically uh, a linear accelerator or a bunch of linear accelerators, but then there is magnets turning it every now and then. 
So we're able to create a, a circular path with uh, accelerators, with uh, sorry, with linear small linear accelerators. Each there's a linear accelerator piece of it. There's only one piece, and then we keep changing the direction using many many magnets. And you can make these things incredibly long and incredibly powerful. Uh, for example, the, the latest is the Large Hadron Collider in CERN in Switzerland. Okay, so basically we have a bunch of linear, we have start off with a linear accelerator, and then you get a bunch of other synchrotrons, and then finally you get to the final one, which is CERN. So this is a picture of it from above. This is, that's Lake Geneva over there. And over here is the actual CERN building. But underground is 27 kilometers of tube, okay, of, of these uh, magnets. There's 192 magnets turning it and it's continually being accelerated as it goes around and they're able to get 99.99999999 a lot percent a very 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 close to the speed of light for protons and they're able to collide at 13 tera electron volts which is almost the big bang this is a couple microseconds after the big bang energies so this is how we can actually uh, investigate what the universe looked like a couple microseconds after it came to be, okay, and what sort of conditions were there? Um, what, what was what was matter like? What were the what were the laws of physics like? Because at those energies, um, the laws of physics actually sort of combine. They sort of become uh, unified. Uh, the the electromagnetic force and the weak nuclear force are actually the same thing at that point. Um, so things get very strange. Okay, so this is this is the, the the Large Hadron Collider in CERN, and there's actually along the way there's a bunch of different detectors where they can collide stuff together. So here's an, a schematic diagram of this. Uh, so. Here we start off with two these linear accelerators where they start off the beam path and then we get a bunch of different synchrotrons and another synchrotron and then we send it into the big large hadron collider and then at these detectors we have collisions where you can actually see and they take the beams and actually cross them and um, all these protons are colliding at incredibly high energies and all kinds of strange uh, particles are, are are created for split seconds, you know, nanoseconds. But in that time, they're able to still do some some observations of them and come up with some some simple things like mass and um, energy and that sort of stuff. Um, again, it's 192 superconducting magnets. And uh, to do that, to get these these magnets uh, to superconducting, that means that they have no resistance. Their electrons basically, uh, as superconductors, their electrons basically um, stick together and become one. Um, and they they no longer, they can actually become one quantum state and uh, no longer resist each other. Uh, electrons, remember Pauli's exclusion principle says that electrons to be in the same state have to be, you know, spin up, spin down, right? And then this causes problems in terms of where resistance comes from, really. But if you can sort of pair them up, into an, uh, a sort of call a Cooper pair of electrons that now behaves like they have spin zero. Uh, they can actually all be in the same quantum state and they have no resistance. So to do that though, it has to be very, very cold. So this whole 27 kilometer tube is filled with liquid helium. And they've got it down to one, uh, but it's basically two Kelvin, that's two degrees above absolute zero. That's two degrees above where we can possibly get temperatures down to. Okay? Liquid helium is also a very strange thing. Uh, so helium, once you get it down, it it itself starts behaving like uh, what we call a boson, where it has no spin and it has no, no viscosity even. Um, if you put liquid helium in a beaker, it'll actually leave the beaker because viscosity is also tied to to those sort of uh, what we call fermion statistics. And the, now it has one quantum state and there's there's no viscosity, it's actually able to leave the beaker. Very strange stuff. So a uh, huge amount of liquid helium is used here. 
the whole thing is super, super cold. Uh, it's, again, 27 kilometers. And you can actually see in this picture the two tubes. The uh, protons are traveling through these in this larger tube. There's uh, two actual beam paths where the uh, protons are going, uh, let's say, in that way and out that way. And then they get to a certain point where they're allowed to cross and we have collisions. And that place is like this. This is the Atlas detector, which is a huge cathedral-sized uh, detector. You can see there's a there's a person. That's how big a person is. This is a little little guy here. That's so this is two meters, right? Approximately. There's some more people up here. This thing is absolutely massive. And this is the point in which actually this piece here actually goes inside there. This is when they were doing some some maintenance. The whole thing can actually move. And when they collide here, let's say there's a collision happens, it creates this absolute fountain of virtual particles and nonsense and mess stuff. And this whole area out here is a detector that's allowed to, uh, it's a whole bunch of different types of detectors that lets scientists see all these things. And it's a huge amount of data. 23 petabytes a second. So there's a, a huge server room that collects all of this, this, this data and has to sort through it. So uh, some of the scientists here are basically just data scientists who have to sift through this data to come up, get, find the, the signal in all the noise to get all these, this, these uh, detections made. Okay? Uh, now, the most famous thing that this Large Hadron Collider has done was actually discover a new particle. Uh, it's called the Higgs boson, which is frighteningly important if it behaves the way that we think it behaves. It actually might, might give matter mass. It might actually mean, it might, might give us an understanding of why inertia exists. Why, does, why do things sort of stick to the fabric of space-time like it does? That's a strange idea. Why do we stick to space-time? Yes, any mass takes space-time and bends it. But whatever. Anyway, so what they discovered was at these incredibly high energies, at 100, about 125 giga electron volts per C squared, which is actually a unit of mass, uh, they were able to see this, this, this data, this spike here. And uh, after doing it again, even more carefully in 2016, they were able to come up with a mass within, you know, um, two decimal places for the, um, the mass of the, of this thing called the Higgs boson. And hopefully in 2021, next year, hopefully with all this stuff happening, whatever, uh, maybe not, and we'll see what happens. It's, it's scheduled to, to be, it's currently being upgraded uh, and hopefully we'll get even more results, more accurate results and higher energy things and maybe we'll find some new stuff. Okay, again, here's, this is the, the, the that's the Higgs boson right there. Okay, uh, and again, it's, it's super important to what, it's the, remember we had our, we have a, a photon that defines electromagnetism. We have a gluon that defines, whoops, a gluon that defines strong nuclear force. And then we have the Z and the W plus and minus, which is the weak nuclear force. And then maybe there's a graviton. We don't know. We don't know, maybe there's a graviton. We haven't, we haven't, we haven't spotted a graviton yet. Uh, we've seen the effect of gravitons on, on space-time, but we haven't actually detected a graviton. But what we're hoping is that there is something called a Higgs boson. Okay? That would be a fifth fundamental force that actually basically defines everything. Okay, all well, mass really. Um, I'm gonna link a whole bunch of videos. This is a complicated video here, and and I've, there's people who've done much more in terms of uh, quantum field uh, science than I understand, and uh, have put together a bunch of videos. I'm gonna put a whole bunch of these on in the sh in the the video notes in the in the details. Uh, feel free to watch as many as you like. There's some fascinating ones on the Higgs boson. Okay, so um, the other thing was uh, at these energies, 
we are able to to see what we call a the quark gluon soup or where a quark and a gluon stick together to form basically what that was what the universe was uh, a couple microseconds of its existence so um, I take lead ions instead of just protons and crash them into each other at incredibly high energies 150 mega electron volts which is huge for a lead ion lead is a very heavy ion how many is it 80 you have to check that go check your periodic table what's the uh, i'm guessing 80 is it 80 i forget uh the atomic mass of um lead so there'll be a whole bunch of protons and neutrons that smack into each other and they produced a new state of matter solid liquid gas plasma and this quark gluon plasma okay this quark gluon soup so what do i want you guys to do for homework so three things for homework first off um, show me that the uh, frequency of our cyclotron can be defined as bq over 2 pi m yeah, that would be the frequency of the alternating current that's how often the current has to flip back and forth okay so check that then i want you to look up what asymptotic freedom means so we've talked about quarks a little bit in terms of um, protons are made of quarks, neutrons are made of quarks. How come we can't see quarks? Why are quarks not free to float around the universe? Why are they confined to baryons of three quarks, of a triplet of quarks? So basically a proton is an up, up, down, a neutron is an up, down down and there's a whole bunch of these right you can make all kinds of those so six quarks we have and just make triplets to make up our our matter our things that are heavy okay right? but how come we've never seen an up quark how come we can't find a strange quark floating around why not and it's because of something called asymptotic freedom i want you to figure that out. it's fascinating as to to what happens when you try to separate a quark okay and uh, last thing is figure do a quick a little bit of research on what is the quark gluon plasma and how can studying a quark gluon plasma at these incredibly high energies actually help us understand what happened in the early universe what was the early universe like what were the forces that existed what sort of matter existed so what forces and matter existed in this early early primordial step of our universe a few microseconds after the big bang okay so this is a uh, this is a really fun lesson um i hope you have as much fun as i had uh, and uh yeah go have some fun look up asymptotic freedom quark gluon plasma and do a quick little derivation there okay so hope you guys are doing well and uh i'll be talking to you later Thank you.